Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for Research 411, a talk show focused on sharing best practices and trending research topics delivered by professional staff and prominent UT Dallas researchers from various disciplines. I am Tiffany Willoughby, Assistant Director in the Office of Research and Innovation. I will serve as your session moderator for today's discussion. During today's talk show, Dr. Heather Hyenga will discuss her research on correcting cancer using targeted genetic therapies. Dr. Hyenga is an associate professor in the bioengineering department at the University of Texas at Dallas. At UT Dallas, Dr. Hyenga's vascular mechanobiology laboratory creates predictive growth and modeling tools of the vasculature investigates the mechanobiology of the arterial cells and improves cancer therapies and delivery. Prior to joining UT Dallas, she achieved her bachelor's in science in 2005 from the University of California, Davis, and a PhD in 2011 from Texas A&M University, both in biomechanical engineering. Dr. Hyenga then joined the University of Maryland as a postdoctoral fellow researching cellular biophysical phenomena. To date, she has published 25 peer-reviewed manuscripts in the field of biomechanics, has given over 70 conference and invited talks, served as a reviewer for many grant and journal organizations, and is funded by the American Heart Association, the National Institutes of Health and Cancer Prevention, and Research Institute of Texas. Welcome to the talk show, Dr. Hyenga. Thank you for that kind of introduction, Tiffany. You are most welcome. Can you tell me a little bit about your research? Of course. Um, so my research is twofold. Um, one, we are developing a cardiovascular model to predict atherosclerosis. So um, when a patient has um, chest angina are just a history of heart disease. They go in, a cardiologist looks at, scans their heart, and detects any um, blockages. And we take that imaging and we are creating a model that can incorporate that imaging and predict sort of the best course of treatment and how stable their arteries are. Um, so that's sort of the bulk of the cardiovascular research. We also do some wet lab stuff um, looking at how immune cells behave in an artery and form these atherosclerotic plaques. Um, and then my other um, fold of the research is the cancer research. Um, so we are looking at um, a rare cancer that is based on a genetic mutation and how to treat that rare cancer. Excellent. And um, this rare cancer, does it have a specific name? And can you tell us a little more in detail about it? How does this cancer occur? Um, any additional information you can provide would be appreciated. Yeah, yeah. I mean, cancers are so unique. Um, this one in particular, about you have a chance of one in 1.6 million um, of getting it, so it's pretty unlikely, um, but the cause is unknown. Um, but it, it is caused by a genetic mutation, although it's not um, hereditary or familiar, um, which means you're not born with the mutation. Um, so all of your cells in your body are normal, except for the cancer cells. The cancer cells are the only one that have this mutation. And like most cancers, they have, they're riddled with lots of mutations that cause a cell to proliferate uncontrollably. Um, this mutation on chromosome 12, um, basically when the cell is dividing, chromosome 12 typically um, uh, replicates itself and then, you know, part half goes into each cell. Well, in the, this process, for whatever reason, um, two genes on chromosome 12, the gene for NAB2, and the gene for STAT6, um, they didn't divide properly. They kind of folded and then fused together. Um, and this inversion and fusion um, caused NAB2, which is typically seven exons, um, to only be, you know, a few exons. Um, and STAT6, which is typically 22 exons, 
to be just um, a, a shorter version of that. So because I, I, there's lots of variation and everyone has a different fusion point. <laughs> so we always think, what's your fusion? Um, so and this gene fusion causes early response um, growth factors to be upregulated and then hence the increase in or continued proliferation of the cancer cell. OK, very good. And and as part of your research, can you tell us what you are looking at as far as um, uh, maybe treatment options or some ways to um, interfere with the production of the cancer? Yeah, yeah. So for the, the cancers that are driven by um, one mutation or a, a few mutations, um, the kind of solution, obvious solution, would be to um, target that fusion, that genetic abnormality. Um, so in the lab, we are trying to target that genetic fusion, <coughs> both pharmaceutically um, through genetic engineered um, components and then through sort of small protein um, fragments that basically bind to the fusion um, and to suppress it from being read or transcribed and translated. Um, so blocking this fusion should theoretically stop um, the early response growth factors and um, you know stop the proliferation. Um, so we are doing this through uh, CRISPR-Cas9. Originally we were doing it through CRISPR-Cas9, which is a gene editor and kind of enzyme that goes into the nucleus, into the DNA, of, uh, of cells and it can snip out the fusion. Um, it can also insert in a suicide gene. So any cell, and again, these are only the cancer cells, all the rest of your cells in your body are normal and won't have this fusion. Then any cell with the fusion, it will clip it out and put in a suicide gene. Um, so we're doing that editing approach at the DNA level, but also at the RNA level. So after the DNA is um, transcribed then it forms into RNA which goes out from the nucleus into the cytoplasm and that's a little bit easier to target because the gene editor can just go into the cell find the RNA and target um, basically the RNA so they can um, edit the fusion out or put a suicide gene in um, and so that's one approach and then we are also looking at it through anti-sense oligonucleotides um, which these oligonucleotides, they basically go into your cell as well, uh, all cells, but only the cancer cells will have the fusion, and they will complementary block the fusion. So by blocking it, it can't be read, it can't be translated, um, and therefore the, the cancer causing effects won't happen. And then the third approach is the pharmaceutical one. Um, so that's just repurposing FDA approved drugs to try to treat um, this pathway. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Hyanga. Um, have you worked with certain collaborators within the university or even externally on uh, this research? And if so, how have you been able to work together uh, to find some solutions? Yes, um, as I, I mentioned, my background is sort of in cardiovascular um, research, so I um, didn't have a lot of, of history on cancer. Um, however, UT Dallas has so many smart people um, with so many talents and expertise. Um, so here in UT Dallas, um, Leo Belaris, Dr. Leo Belaris, um, and Dr. Yi Li, um, who's a research scientist in the Belaris lab. Um, the Belarus lab is focused on gene editing. Um, so I, I approached them and said, hey, I have this rare cancer um, that is, is caused by um, a gene fusion. Can we target it? Can we um, correct it? And he said, I don't know, but I'm willing to try. <laughs> um, so primarily through him that we've made a lot of progress. Absolutely. Well, that's great, and I'm glad that you were able to find some collaborators uh, on campus to work with you. Um, all right, so 
Yeah. Are there any additional ways that you have been able to synthesize your cardiovascular research with that genetic engineering? Yeah, I mean, this tumor is, the tumor is called hemangioperisytoma, um, which as the name is derived, it's derived from hemangi, which is va the, the vessels. Um, so this tumor forms what was thought from the parasite, uh, which is a, a uh, vascular cell. And the parasite is what has this genetic mutation and then it just keeps proliferating and more, more, more and more parasites, cancerous parasites, um, form the tumor. Um, the tumor is highly vascular. Um, you know, it, it really, in an MRI, it just lights up very white because it's so uh, vascular. Um, so my research as a cardiovascular researcher, um, I can understand how the vascular nature of this cancer is. And part of the pharmaceutical approach is um, anti-angiogenics. So basically to prevent um, blood vessel formation. The idea being to starve um, the tumor from blood vessels and therefore nutrients. Um, this is sort of the go-to approach currently in the clinic. There's no approved drug for this cancer, um, but that's something that usually has sort of a, you know, six months stability before it stops working. So um, yeah, that's the connection to cardiovascular in this cancer. Absolutely perfect, and thank you. Now, I know that um, you talked about some potential solutions and therapies. Um, have you had the opportunity to test any of those therapies on human subjects, or have they uh, any of them been approved to uh, utilize on patients? No, um, not patients yet, um, but we are in We've created a xenograft model in a mouse. Um, so we have mice currently on campus that have these large tumors in their hind limb um, of this, this rare cancer. Um, so first step will be to test the therapeutic, the promising therapeutics in the mouse. And if that um, shows stability of the cancer or hopefully shrinkage, um, then the next step will be in humans. Very good. Um, it looks like we do have some questions from the audience. So I'm gonna go ahead and move into that Q&A chat. The first one is, how did you become interested in researching cancer? So I became uh, in, interested in this cancer in 2014 when I was diagnosed with hemangiopericytoma. Um, it it uh, came in the brain at the lower school base. Um, and unfortunately this cancer has a prognosis of about uh, six years of life expectancy. Um, I'm on number year number eight, um, but it has traveled from the brain to the liver, to the bone, to the lungs. Um, so it's it's a very aggressive cancer. Um, so that was my my first motivation for for researching it. Um, you know, since then we've found that a lot of cancers have are caused by genetics and, and isolate gene fusions. So it can, this if we find a therapy that works um, through gene editing, we can just edit it for various other um, rare diseases or cancers. Thank you for sharing, Dr. Hayinga. We appreciate you and the research that you are currently studying. Uh, another question for you from the audience is, is there somewhere we can go to donate towards your research? Yes, um, UT Dallas has um, a link that you can go to. Um, let me see. And go. while you are pulling that up, um, I will bring the audience's attention to an article from the News Center that is in the Q&A chat. Please feel free to check it out to learn a little bit more about Dr. Hyanga's research. So this is a rare cancer. So unfortunately, um, it has not been um, funded by any like CPRID or NIH yet, although we've um, applied for several, <laughs> several grants. Um, being a rare cancer, it's, it's hard for people to get excited about saving 
a hundred people <laughs> when they can save um, thousands. So unlike the typical, typical big um, government funding agencies, we did start funding. Thank you, Dr. Hanga. And you know, um, while you say that maybe Saving 100 people might not be the top priority in, in funding your type of research. Um, I wanted to take some of the information that you shared earlier related to um, using current methodologies to perhaps treat uh, hemangioparasitoma, correct? Yeah. Okay. So maybe using an alternative uh, therapy to treat the cancer um, may also be beneficial to a larger study, correct? If you find that is is in fact effective, so. That, that's correct, yes. Um, muscular dystrophy, um, a lot of these sort of rare genetic um, diseases, that is what ASOs, antisense oligonucleotides, um, have been really um, good at doing. And there's a few approved for muscular dystrophy, um, clusterolemia, um, and a few others. But um, RASOs, they show pretty good response at binding to the fusion, and they suppress about 70% of the um, fusion transcript. So, um, you know, it, it shows really promising results in the Petri dish. So hopefully it'll be translatable. Absolutely. That sounds very promising. Um, and a question again from the audience is this, what has been the hardest part about the research thus far? So the hardest part um, has sort of been first, um, the, this cancer being so rare, we didn't have any um, cells with the fusion. Um, so we first had to engineer the cell line. So we had to create the fusion in a normal cell. Um, and that process was actually harder than we envisioned. At first, we thought it was going to be like six months to do it. It turned out to be about a year um, just because you have to clip it at two places. Then you have to let this in random inversion happen and fusion happen and all those events to be orchestrated such to create um, the cancer cell. It was, a, it was a little bit difficult. Um, and we started to try to do the fusion in parasites because that's what this thought to dry, uh, the cancer is thought to be derived from. However, to transfect the gene editor into the parasite was very low efficiency. Um, so we used colon cancer cells and inserted this gene fusion in there. So that was a bit challenging, um, getting the cell line developed. Now, um, now that the cancer is, um, our research is well known, um, we've had four different patients go through surgery and donate their cells to us. So we have four patient derived cell lines um, in addition to our engineered cell line. Um, and I would say that that was challenging, but um, the second most challenging aspect, at first we were trying to edit the DNA because um, of course if you edit the DNA, then it all the daughter cells also have the, the correct um, DNA instead of with the fusion. However, getting into the DNA, getting into the nucleus um, with this CRISPR-Cas9 editor was very low efficiency, um, like 1%. Um, so we had to scrap that, that approach, and now we're editing the RNA, which, again, reduced the, that RNA by about 70%. So it has good efficiency. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit more about the benefits of having those four individuals cell lines. How has that impacted your research? Um, you know, I would imagine to the positive, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so any therapy that we develop, we're going to need to test in, you know, a cancer cell, um, hopefully a, a patient, but um, the patient derived cancer cells um, Conversely to the engineered cells, they just have this one fusion. Um, so it's unknown if the fusion suppression alone can suppress the cancer. Whereas a patient derived cells, they have potentially other genetic abnormalities or um, different pathways. And so by testing it in a patient or, or therapies in a patient cell, 
um, give us more confidence that it would work in in humans. Um, and these patients have different fusion types. Like I said, NAB2 and STAT6, they can cross at different parts. So now we're designing different custom um, ASOs to different fusion types. Um, so we can see if it suppresses all of hemangioparasitoma um, kind of cancer types. Okay. And I don't believe that this question has been answered, but it does fall in line with, with some of the conversations that you're having right now. How effective are the gene-targeted therapies and how accurate are they to alter gene fusion? It, does it work every time? Does it work most of the time? Yep, yeah. So question or the answer is, uh, it's kind of unknown. Um, so ASO treatments are, are relatively new. Um, so there's a lot in clinical trials right now. There's only a few approved. Um, and delivery is sort of the hardest aspect. Um, that's why I don't, I don't believe there's any ASOs approved for solid cancer. Um, it's easier to target um, other like blood issues or uh, stuff in the eye. We can use a dropper um, just because getting the concentration of ASO that you need to the um, target site is, is the challenge. Um, so, um, yeah, so the, the delivery aspect is going to be our biggest um, challenge and you know, we may need to deliver the ASO um, directly into the tumor itself um, or try intrathecal through the CSF or um, an IV or, you know, but we're working with companies currently to um, optimize the, um, the bodies. The body naturally has a, a ability to destroy um, any kind of pharmaceutical or um, ASO that you present to it. So to kind of block the ASO from being just immediately destroyed. OK, um, another question that I have for you uh, is related to some of the studies that you have on the lab animals, because I know you haven't conducted uh, human subjects or clinical trials to date, but when you are running uh, the tests or the therapies on the lab animals, are you able to study the effects of the procedures on them? Are there any side effects? Do the animals experience any side effects as a result? Um, so we haven't tested any therapies on the Xenograft um, animal models yet. Um, so we've just created the, the tumor in the hind limb of the mouse. Um, so, so far the, my, the mouse are, are fine, but we haven't seen, we will be testing for side effects, of course. Um, just there, they should not have side effects because again, this ASL only targets cancer cells. Um, so any other cell should not have the fusion and um, there shouldn't be any any uh, side effect unless there's an off target um, segment of DNA that is very similar to the fusion, which is a possibility, but we ran it through sort of a bioinformatics model and these are, are unique, um, so. Absolutely. Well, I will give the audience one last shout out. If you have any questions for Dr. Hyenga related to her research, please drop them in the chat. And Dr. Hyenga, I would just ask you to give the audience any last minute um, uh, wrap up of your research. Was there anything else you would like to showcase to the audience related to your research? Um, I would just say if, if you um, have a loved one or something like that with um, sort of a genetic issue or, um, you know, UT Dallas is a great place for um, just research and exploring um, different therapies. And um, I, I think we've made in just two years a lot of progress. Um, and currently there's sort of a company that we're working with called Ionis. Um, and this company is based in California and it makes 
ASOs um, for different genetic uh, diseases in one essentially. Um, and so, yeah, they are they are currently making some ASOs for us, and um, with the idea that if it shows good results in mice, um, to move forward with it. Um, but also genetic engineering, um, CRISPR-Cas9, CRISPR-Cas13, um, putting it into a adenovirus or an AAV and to be delivered into the body is uh, totally possible and it can really help edit um, genetic issues. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Hyenga. And audience members, I am dropping a few links in that Q&A chat. Uh, if you want to learn more about Dr. Hyenga, please visit those links. Um, and I have one more to drop in there, and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Well, thank you for joining us today, Dr. Hyenga. Audience, thank you for attending our program. If you enjoyed today's talk show, please suggest it to a friend. To stay abreast of Office of Research and Innovation Information and Programming, please follow us on Instagram and Twitter and subscribe to our newsletter. Feel free to use your phone to scan the QR code on this slide or follow the link posted in the chat. Thank you and have a nice afternoon. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, Dr. Hinda.